As you read and evaluate the scientific literature, it's useful to always keep in mind the possibility that bias is introduced somewhere in the research cycle. And as a consequence, it's good to have some tools at your availability that allow you to detect the presence of bias. Now, bias can be introduced throughout the research process, either more or less intentional. It's therefore useful to know how to prevent introducing bias in the literature yourself, but also how to detect it if you're evaluating published findings. Now, depending on how skeptical you are, you might want to heed the advice of Deborah Mayo, who says, confronted with the statistical news flash of the day, your first question is, are the results due to selective reporting, cherry picking, or any number of other similar ruses? Now, depending on how trustworthy you are in general, this might not be the first question that you ask, but it makes sense to consider the possibility of bias. In extreme cases, we have research misconduct, where people actually make up data or results or change or admit data or results, such as the research that they eventually present actually isn't an accurate representation of reality anymore. A well-known case of research misconduct is a paper by Andrew Wakefield, which claimed that there was a link between the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine, MMR, and autism, which greatly impacted the public's perception of the risk of first vaccines. However, the paper was eventually retracted in 2010. There are also less intentional mistakes that people introduce that are just statistical reporting errors. Now, these statistical reporting errors can be quite unintentional. You might mistakenly have chosen an incorrect degrees of freedom to report for your test, but they can also be slightly more intentional. Based on work by Michel Neuter and colleagues, we know that some people actually report a p-value of 0.056 as a p-value that's smaller than 0.05. They also developed a statistical tool that you can use to upload a manuscript you're working on and to use this tool as a statistics check similar to a spell check that you might want to perform on your paper. Now this only works if you report statistics in APA style, but if you do, it's a very nice way to prevent errors from being introduced in your own paper. There are also situations where we just see that there are inconsistencies in the published results. Results do not match the data generating process. Many papers report means that are actually not possible given the sample size that's reported in the same paper. This is known as a Grimm test. To give an example, this is a well-known classic study by Festinger and Carl Smith who examined how enjoyable people rate a task depending on whether they were paid $1 to perform it or $20. And they concluded that people find a task much more enjoyable if they actually were paid less, sort of as a compensation. Well, I didn't get a lot of money for it, so I must have liked doing this task. However, if we take a look at the means that are reported, we see that in this table, three of the means are actually not statistically possible given the sample sizes of 20 observations in each group. Another source of possible bias is known as hypothesizing after the results are known. Instead of actually testing a prediction and controlling the error rates that come with the statistical test, people can look at all the statistical results in their output and generate a hypothesis based on whatever finding was statistically significant, which can greatly inflate the type 1 error rate. Now, I like this cartoon because it sort of looks like the professor is doing all the shooting and then the poor PhD student actually has to fix everything after the fact. Let's finally take a look at publication bias, one of the major sources of bias in the published literature. Research that appears in the published literature is systematically unrepresentative of the real population of completed studies. And there are several reasons for this. For example, you might have a personal judgment that a study that you performed turns out that it wasn't actually as good as you thought before you saw the results. So based on the results, you decide that the study didn't do what you intended to do. This might be correct, it might be introducing bias, and it's probable that you'd had this thought a little bit less if the results 
had turned out statistically significant. Another reason is that people prefer to write up positive results, maybe because they fear that negative results have a higher risk of being rejected, or they simply think that given many data sets they could be writing up, writing up the positive results has a better impact on their future careers. Now, it would be nice if we're able to correct for publication bias in some way. We know that we have a biased literature, so it would be nice to apply some sort of technique, a bias correction, so that we can erase the bias and have reliable and accurate effect size estimates, regardless of the fact that the literature is currently biased. Regrettably, we don't know how to do this, and there are very good reasons to assume that we simply never are able to correct for publication bias because we can't model the bias accurately. This means that we can detect bias, but we can never correct for publication bias. Let's nevertheless take a look at some of these detection techniques. Now, there are some older bias detection techniques that I won't discuss that are no longer considered valid. One of these is fail-safe N, and some reviewers or editors still insist that people use it, but really, nowadays it's only useful to identify meta-analysis that are just not state-of-the-art. One way to visualize the results of a meta-analysis is through a funnel plot. And this is a useful tool also to explain how certain bias detection tools work. In this case, we see an overview of a scientific literature because every individual dot in this graph is a single study. The single study is represented as a standardized mean difference, the effect size, on the x-axis. On the y-axis, the standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So the smaller the standard error, the larger the sample size. That means that in this specific meta-analysis, there are some small studies with a sample size of only 56 observations, and those will be somewhere at the bottom of this graph. In the middle, we find studies that had around 114 as a sample size, and at the top, we find the largest studies that are included in the meta-analysis with a sample size of 562. At the top of the white pyramid, we would have the effect size estimate if the standard error is exactly zero, or if we would have an infinite sample size, which is of course not possible to reach. The relationship between the standardized mean difference and the standard error is such that all studies that would fall within the white pyramid are not statistically significant. For the smallest study, we would have to find a really large effect size for the confidence interval around the effect size not to overlap with zero. For larger studies at the top, the confidence interval is much narrower, so they don't need to be that far away from zero to still be statistically significant. And in this picture, we see an incredibly biased meta-analysis, because every individual study is actually statistically significant, or it's falling outside of this white triangle. So in a way, a funnel plot, as long as we have a large enough number of observations or studies included in the meta-analysis, is a useful way to at least visually try to detect bias. One approach that had been proposed in the past to detect and correct publication bias, although it doesn't correct bias at all, was the trim and fill technique. Here we see that we had an original biased set of studies, only significant results, but now we also see certain white dots within the white triangle. So these are non-significant inferred studies. You can actually see that some of these studies are simply the mirror image of the significant results that we have access to, that were in the published literature. The trim and fill method sort of looks at what might be missing and fills in the meta-analysis with artificial made-up studies and thinks, well, they might have looked something like this. And then it calculates an effect size estimate combining all the studies, both the ones that we saw and the ones that were inferred, and gives a corrected effect size estimate. 
Here we see that the corrected effect size estimate is slightly closer to zero than the meta-analytic effect size estimate only based on significant studies, which is the black triangle. Nevertheless, I can tell you, because this is a simulated meta-analysis, that I know that the true effect size in this simulation was actually zero. In this simulation, there was no true effect and massive publication bias. So as a consequence, we can see that the trim and fill method is actually not giving us an accurate, unbiased effect size estimate. So it's a useful tool to sort of detect bias, but it's not a useful tool to correct bias at all. Another technique for bias detection and correction is known as meta-regression. In meta-regression, what we're trying to do is provide an estimate of the unbiased meta-analytic effect size. If there would be no bias in the meta-analysis, the regression lines would overlap with the dotted line. But we see two regression lines, one straight, one curved. The one is called PET, the other is called P's. And these don't overlap with the dotted line. This indicates that some form of bias might be present. Here we'll focus on PET, which tries to estimate the effect size if we would have a perfectly accurate estimate, when the standard error would be zero, or if we would have an infinite sample size. So if we follow this straight line along the edge of the white triangle, we actually see it points up and crosses the zero line very close to a standardized mean difference of zero. So it's really estimating that the unbiased effect size is very close to zero, which happens to be true in this simulated case, because we created a biased meta-analysis where the true effect size is actually zero. So under some assumptions, you can see that these bias correction techniques work, but we never really know if these assumptions hold in our meta-analysis. Another bias detection technique is known as P-curve analysis. And I also discussed this technique in my previous MOOC. It's based on a meta-analysis not of effect sizes, but of p-values. And it plots the p-value distribution. It compares the observed p-values, here represented by the blue line, with the p-value distribution that you would expect if there is no true effect, here the horizontal red line, and a p-value distribution you would expect if there is a true effect with at least some power, represented here with the green line. Now we can see that the p-values are very peculiarly distributed. We see quite a lot of p-values that are just below 0.05, which is actually a real indication that some bias is present. In this case, bias is introduced because the authors of the studies that are analyzed here performed a covariate analysis. The authors of this p-curve thought that it might be true that people only perform a covariate analysis when the original analysis that they planned yielded a non-significant p-value, after which people might just try out different covariates up to the point that they find a statistically significant result. And this flexibility in the data analysis would yield a pattern that looks exactly like we see in the blue line. Now, all these techniques that I discuss only detect bias under certain models. They all have specific assumptions. So they cannot give universal yes, there is bias, no, there is no bias answers. They tell you something about the probability of bias being present under certain assumptions of the model. If they detect bias, there might be reason to worry. It's a red flag that goes up. If they don't detect bias, there might still be reason to worry but the bias is not detected under the models that these bias detection tools operate on. Finally, there might be some bias in the moment that we choose to perform a meta-analysis. This might especially be true for internal meta-analyses. If, like I mentioned before, you decide to do an internal meta-analysis, but you only do this after the first non-significant study that you observe, so you try to use a meta-analysis as a trick to make non-significant results look much better, then this in itself is actually introducing bias. Because whether and when to perform a meta-analysis is influenced by looking at the available results. So this is 
also a source of bias you need to keep in mind. Now, regrettably, it would have been nice if I could tell you that our scientific literature looks perfectly fine. But the truth is that the scientific literature is not unbiased. And you always need to take this into account when you evaluate research findings.